Hey, I'm Joe Connors. And I'm David Connors. And we're of How To Music, the podcast. We want to point out that um, in this next podcast you're going to watch, there's a big blurb that we go on to, a big talking point about the fact that you should thoroughly test your gear before you bring it to the gig. And we were a little remiss in that, that we had tested yeah. a fair bit, but we came into a, quite the technical difficulty. So unfortunately, the video component of our podcast went for a... <laughs> Yeah, but it's how to amplify, and I think our audio is maybe the best we've done yet. We worked extra hard at very crisp, nice audio. Yeah, and we want to give a shout out to Leo because he showed up looking all so handsome, and there's no video to prove it. So we have no proof of the awesome hairstyle he was rocking that day. Leo, thanks Absolutely. for doing your hair so well. Yeah. Uh, I, I wish I could say the same for myself. That's where the cap comes in. Yeah, oh, and we also referenced the fact that AV stands for auto video, and we are... Mostly audio and very little video, and uh, as a result, producer Ryan is working really hard to fix it all. So thanks to Ryan for doing all the extra editing and put together a great how-to music for how to amplify your music. Hope you enjoy. Enjoy listening to it, not watching it. All right, we're here for another episode of How To Music. This time, we've had a lot of musicians on the show talking about how to make their music better, how to write, how to go digital and analog, all sorts of good things that way. It doesn't matter how good of a product of music you create if you don't amplify it. So today we've got Leo Gray joining us talking about how to amplify your music. Leo, thanks for making it out. Thank you. Uh, we're Dave. here on site Leo. at the old music store. Yeah. yeah. So there's lots of memories in this building here. A lot of nostalgia. Uh, so just to change the location, just to kind of bring that to attention too. So it's, I didn't even realize that element of it, yeah, that, that this is the old music store that we're yeah. sitting in. Like, I just didn't think of it that way. It was, but it's where I started my career, right hey, here. Hey, there you go. At the age of? <laughs> five. Five. So I think well, 1983. Oh, the year I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I was upstairs in diapers. <laughs> Uh, so Leo, you have a long list of, uh, skills and, <laughs> Many um, skills. <laughs> and things you've done in the industry from, uh, teaching guitar, uh, repairing, uh, retail sales, live audio, recording, touring, subbing on gigs, mm -hmm. writing, composing, arranging, and am I, so, is it, there's got to be more. I mean, I'm just sure being the, I, I don't remember. the tour bus driver, I'm sure. <laughs> I can do that too. Yeah, yeah. And I would. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, a stellar musician and a stellar dude. And uh, oh, thank you. give us a little rundown on uh, what you're up to. What I'm up to. Uh, these days, um, I'm running a company called Apps Alive. Uh, we're, we're mobile event professionals. So uh, we specialize in doing outdoor festivals and uh, setting up a big stage and sound, lights, video wall, back line, and running it all and uh, making the artists on stage feel like rock stars. That's pretty much the, the idea. So. I love that because, you know, getting the, the performers in the zone when they're about to be mm -hmm. ready to go is a big part of it. You know, they want to have that moment where they're ready to rock and you're going to make sure everything else they don't have to worry about it. Exactly. Exactly. That's that's the idea, right? There's a psychology in music, I find, these days where if I can make the artist feel like they're taken care of, they will perform better, right? Oh, well, because most, most, you know, most musicians that gig bars that do whatever, they are taking care of all of that tech stuff themselves. They're setting up their own PA. They're setting up their own mics. They're running sound, but they're really not sure what it's like out there. They're guessing, and they're hoping for the best. And you get good at guessing, for sure. We all do. But when you can show up and you know that somebody's just taking care of it, you just plug in your stuff and you can play and you like the way it sounds in your monitors, you will be reassured that out there, hopefully the production company is going to take care of your audio out there and you can perform the way you see in your head. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's a really cool part, right? Like that's where the musician really shines, right? Otherwise it's just another four people up on stage making noise, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I can agree with that so much because we do our own sound for mm -hmm. our shows. Um, and so I have a wireless pack on my bass and I can run out front while I'm trying to play bass with one hand and listen to the sound and run back on stage yep. and adjust things. Luckily we have a high end console that we can save settings and EQs exactly. and, and, and just load from where we left off and then try and do our best again. But once again, mid show things change, sure. you play with more 
more energy, you get excited. Uh, I mean, even temperature, humidity, room, yep. crowd noise, you want a, a balance to that and you can't as a performer at that point. So I sacrifice my performance to, to make our band sound better. Yep. Um, so I guess let's, and I appreciate. <laughs> I appreciate. What you. you're not going to yeah. leave the kit to go do? It? Yeah, yeah. With that, between between well, the kit the, banjo the combo, singing lead, playing banjo, yeah. playing drums at the same time with your feet, with the baran beside you, and then I want you to mix sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm just true. playing yeah. the bass. So no, sure. but my vocals, I can just kind of not sing. Them. What's interesting though is that kind of speaks to the personality type too. That a lot of the sound techs that I know are generally like the ones who are like, I don't want to be on stage. I don't want to be there. I'll leave that to you guys and I will go back and my job will be behind the scenes and I love it. Uh, for yourself, that's different because you're the kind of guy that's quite comfortable on stage, off stage, mm. beside stage, sure. right? Doing doing all of it. So it's interesting. And, and for yourself as well. I love being on stage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Performing. I just and, don't want to be center stage. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. Right, right. So side stage, edge, back corner of the stage, yep. wearing black in front of a black curtain. <laughs> With a black base, just 100%. a floating head. Oh yeah, that's me. <laughs> I like it. Sign me up. It's like those, like the puppet, the the like black knight light uh, puppet shows. Just For be sure. your head, and you're like Bob. That's on the right. Road. If I get a microphone that was this big and nobody could see my face, I'd be all right with it. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> it's one of those things though, where I think you see those those different personality types that get attracted yeah. to the sound tech role. And uh, and I know lots of guys that I've talked to over the years where they're like, you know, you do, you guys do that, and I'll do this. But the craft of, of sound tech. Now, for you, that probably would have started with years of yourself having to mix sound in bars, clubs, etc. On the yeah. road gigging. Yeah, it's it's weird because like in my twenties, even my teens and twenties when I was first playing bars, I don't even know who set up the PA. Like I remember playing one bar in Newmarket, and and we were singing through guitar amps because we just didn't have a PA, and that seemed normal to me. Um, and then even when I was touring in bands in my 20s I had no idea what PA was somebody always took care of it so I just showed up and made noise as a guitar player singer and then out of necessity it became this thing you know when I started doing the cover scene especially and it's like well who's bringing the PA and like oh I have some speakers and I have a mixing board and I guess I'll start pushing faders around right and you start understanding what the board can do what the speakers can do what they sound like you know and and sculpting it and and really trying to go, well, let's make the lead singer sound really good because I'm a big believer if the singer sounds good, everyone will negate the rest of what's happening in the band, right? Like people, <laughs> yeah. the first thing they complain about at a show is I can't hear the singer. It's like yeah. the very first thing, right? So I just make sure that's the first thing people hear and then usually the kick drum right after it. Yeah. No one ever says I can't hear the bass player. <laughs> no one ever says that. No. Right. Or the hi-hat. Like it's, yeah. just, it's not a thing, right? Yeah. But, um, but it's just it's just the way it is. You start layering these things and and... And you can go deep. Like the technology that's out now with boards is insanity, right? Yeah. It's like what they can do. Um, it's very, very cool though. Yeah, you would have had a rack this tall oh. full of rack gear, compressors, yeah. effects. Silly. So <laughs> let, let's rip this apart for our yeah. audience sure. and kind of uh, help up. them because we're, we're touching on a lot of things. So let's, let's uh, run it in order. So, I mean... PA is that professional audio? Would I say? guess. Yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> guess. Sounds good to me. And all of us say PA, and none of us. I don't know if any yeah. of us really know what it means, but I'm pretty sure it's professional audio. Yeah. Or is it personal amplification? Ooh. Mm, well, I don't think so. Fire up the it's Google not very personal. It's not very personal. <laughs> no. Or pro amplification. I don't know. Professional I, audio. audio. Yeah. Okay. Here's a fun one I pro got. Audio. Was uh, uh, AV versus AV? Like obviously audio, 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 video. audio video. But it's yeah. funny because like like they're like, oh, can you send your AV guy? Yeah. And I'm like, we're just an A guy. <laughs> you take care of the V. We got the A. Leo has the video wall. Does that count as the V? Yeah. yeah. There, I don't you know. Go. It's like I, the only visual I'm bringing is. <laughs> is this, right? this, okay. Okay. Yeah. So so continue. <laughs> let's rewind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the dream is, and it's a dream we're but just starting to achieve is you show up. There's a pro audio guy, sound technician, mm -hmm. and you say, where do I plug in? And I can just focus on my craft as sure. a musician. So that's the, that's the dream, but you got to go a long way to get there. Usually. So <laughs> usually, usually yeah. yeah. I mean, some people, I guess, jump all the way there. So if we rewind this all the way back to, I'm starting out and you had guitar amps plugging into, that was probably a not the best quality of audio. Oh, so definitely not. So yeah. step one is you've got a band and you're now doing a gig and there's no no sound system supplied. What what should I be looking at getting and how do I understand that process? Sure. So I mean the easiest thing to think of is get 
two speakers, one that would be on the left side of your stage, one would be on the right side of the stage, and a mixer or a powered mixer of some sort, something that's going to power those speakers, or if you have powered speakers, the reverse, but you can get in all that tech stuff later. But yeah, basically a soundboard, two speakers, and that's everyone's going to plug in that soundboard. It's going to feed those two speakers, and you know, at least you can amplify things like vocals that you know you need to amplify because it's not going to be heard over a drum set, right? Vocals are very important. That's usually what people come for, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and then you see what else needs something, like keyboards, for instance. They're on their own. You know, you're not going to hear anything, so they need to go into your PA as well. Mm -hmm. You know, everything else, like, you know, drums and guitars don't have to. And a lot of bar gigs, nobody does that. I do because yeah. I have more gear than brains. So I, <laughs> I mic up everything because I think it sounds better balanced, right? And you can control volumes. You can control like the overall volume of things. But uh, for most people, yeah, it's most PAs they buy are to put their keyboards and their vocals into to start. Yeah. Well, and I think that word balanced was key. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that uh, checking your um, your uh, ego at the door as mm. a as an individual performer. Sure. Understanding that you're trying to amplify and make everyone louder so that the audience gets a great experience and can hear everyone. Yeah. Um, and so you want to think of your end product as, as, as a band and now you're figuring out how to present that to the audience. So if the guitar player comes out with a 412 Marshall, 100 watt, yeah, all two players. stack and the bass player comes out with a 10 watt practice amp, yep. you have a problem. A hundred percent. So pairing the pro audio system to your backline. So I, let's, ex I guess, explain backline, what backline yeah. is. So backline are the amps that uh, your instruments go through. Uh, would dr drums be drums part, part of backline? Back for sure. Uh, and that's guitar been, amps, bass amps, if you have a keyboard amp a or keyboard an acoustic amp guitar amp. And those are usually designed for you to achieve your tonality or your sound. Um, and then at that point, you're going to give that sound to a when we get to our dream point to the sound engineer, yep. uh, sound technician, who's going to amplify that even louder. So having a rig that's so big and loud that you're trying to have 5,000 people in a, in a, in a field here it is not really the goal because you're going to blow your vocalist away. You're yep. not going to be balanced and you're going to blow other people off the stage. So, and same if a bass player is running an 810 fridge cab with a, a uh, thousand or fifteen hundred watt solid state head. Yeah, he's also going to be now louder than the thirty watt uh, Vox amp. So just sure. just think about balance and what your tone is is, is I guess the goal in that yep. when you're starting out. So then you've bought a PA that's balanced to your back line and you're starting to learn it. So you get to the gig, you're setting up, and you're getting feedback. What are probably some of the major simple solutions to that? Mm -hmm. uh, I can touch upon some of them, but I'll let you yeah, run with yeah, it, yeah. Leo. So yeah. I've never set it up before, and I've just put it where I think it looks right, right? and yeah. now I'm, I've turned it on and it's screaming at me. So, I mean, the, the easiest thing is to make sure that the PA is in front of the band. So <laughs> a lot of people, I've seen people put like speakers behind the drums. like. If, if you know if this is your drummer and this the audience is over there and they're putting the speakers back here and they're saying oh well it's acting as our mains like the what the audience here and monitors for us at the same time well yeah but now this the sound's pointing into your vocal mics which causes what's called the feedback loop right so now your vocal mics are picking up the sound coming out of those speakers and then cycling it back through that same speaker and then a feedback loop is created <laughs> and you get that nice little frequency that rings in my ears for days you know it. 24 yep. hours a day so yeah, make sure the PA is in front of the band, right? That will be that will alleviate a lot of problems right off the top. And then the other thing is called you know uh, gain structure, and and basically there's a trim knob or a gain knob on almost every soundboard for every channel that is on a board. So if you have your vocal channel, will have this gain knob, and it's not one of those things where you just turn it to ten and leave it. It, it. You have to kind of test and see where the meter comes up to. There's colors in music, right? So especially from an audio perspective, green is good. Green is, that's a nice healthy signal. You want a healthy green. Getting into yellow, it's like yellow's getting into dangerous territory, but still okay. Red is bad. Red is really bad. DJs are famous for this. DJs will be like, red. And they're just like, ah, oh, it's so loud and good. And I'm like, no, it's just distorting, right? And the audio doesn't sound good anymore. So 
you know, it, you know, you try to stay within that green to yellow sort of area and everything that you plug into that soundboard will have a different gain structure and you have to kind of not guess, but experiment with that through practice. You should practice with your PA and practice with your bands and, and work on the, all these things so that when you get to a bar, you won't have any of these feedback issues. Mm -hmm. You've already sussed out all the problems, right? And right. it's already done. Right? Yeah. The, the amount of people I know who like will either rent a PA or have a PA and they like only take the time when they get to their venue to mm -hmm. start doing that. And it's yep. just like, that's a nightmare. I just nightmare. dealt with that with a rental where um, it was gain structure. Yeah. They're like, I got the master all the way up. I got the channel all the way up. What's the problem? Why? Because some PAs don't have a trim or gain knob. They have a pad switch oh, or a pad button. Yeah. And, and in, in this instance, it was set to line, not mic. So yeah. you're running a different preamp level. And the, if I was running a mixing console like I have behind me here, you probably can't see in the shot, but um, then I can bring that uh, master volume that I'm sending to the amp. So you'd want to be online then because exactly. then it's, it's quieter and you're sending lots of signal to it. But if I have a microphone that's not producing any volume of itself, any powered signal to the, the, the device, you're going to need a bigger preamp with a higher gain structure. For sure. Uh, so what's brilliant about what you're touching upon here is you want to be on that tour with that sound technician running everything, but right now you're, you're not there yet. Understanding how that gain structure works on the simple level, you don't have to know it crazy, yeah. allows you to properly sound check for that tour sound tech te technician later in life because we often sound check quiet, quieter than we perform. 100%. And that's a real problem because you want to get kind of as close to yellow without really going into yellow. Mm -hmm. So when I sing la da da and then I come out, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, right exactly now our gain structure is <laughs> totally it's messed off. up and okay. you're you're in panic mode trying to bring it down so it seems like i don't need to think about this i don't want to think about pro audio in the club or in the bar setting or where i'm bringing my own stuff but if you take the time to just kind of learn some of it and basic gain structure then when you're sound checking later in life you're going to sound check as closer to where you perform or at exactly. least try to do it as, as a musician who plays uh, a very large plethora of instruments mm -hmm. with a very uh, very wide variety of output so my my banjo my mandolin my ukulele my acoustic guitar and my electric guitar all what i provide are very different and because i'm aware of that i'm able to express that to whoever's doing sound that I know that this has got to be hotter than that. Yep. A lot of them already know, but like when you walk in with a banjo, some, some that can be a curveball oh, for, sure. for some, especially because they all have different pickups. So if you have a more eccentric instrument, uh, you know, you bring your harp out to an event, it's good to know kind of what signal you're providing. So that's just a little thing on uh, as a musician who isn't necessarily the guy who's going to be behind the board, but going to be able to help Put yes. your best product forward. So like a lot of people go out and buy their first acoustic guitar and they learn on that acoustic guitar and then they go to a gig and their acoustic guitar doesn't have a pickup in it, right? Mm, they don't yeah. even know. So they're, you know, the easiest thing to do is to put a mic in front of that sound hole. Problem is if you want some of that back in your monitor, again, that same problem I alluded to earlier, that mic is sitting there, the monitor's on the floor in front of you and you're saying, I want to hear more of it. Well, the mic is picking up that sound coming out of the monitor and it's going to create a feedback loop. What you should have done is said, hmm, I want to start playing live with this guitar. Maybe I should go to Connor's Music and have Dave put in a nice pickup <laughs> into this thing, yeah. right? So that, so I can plug it directly into the board and avoid that problem. Yeah. And and it's, it's thinking just those next steps that are going to help you when you get to that next echelon of gigs, yeah. right? Well, that's a perfect segue there, Leo, because so we've learned we need to set the speakers up in front of our microphones pointing mm -hmm. at the audience. And then we've learned that we got to get gain stage set to green just under yellow. And then we bring up our volumes and we're performing. That's all wonderful. So now the audience is getting a great experience, but me as a performer is not getting any experience mm -hmm. yet. And if I'm a singer, I really do need to hear what I'm singing. Sure. So now we cross right into monitors, which you just mentioned about with the pickup and how do we do a good job of monitoring? Um, like some microphones have polar patterns that have sound rejection behind them so that monitoring works. Like an SM58 is set for a single monitor directly behind the mic where a beta 
its offset rejection is two monitor stereo wedges set left and right and and you have more feedback rejection to to this sides of the mic where a condenser mic doesn't have feedback rejection right. yeah. at all exactly. i like if you have a sure beta they're like well if you have a sure beta you must have at least two wedges per <laughs> per beta yeah. right because it's a, it is a nicer mic that way or yeah, a single one offset you're gonna if you offset it to the left instead of directly behind it it'll be so learning the nuances of your vocal mic so it probably is a good idea for a vocalist to actually think about maybe buying their own microphone and yeah. learning yeah. what microphone would be best suited to their style and then understanding kind of the nuances of how that monitoring works but yeah. that's really technical so let's just say we got sm 50s 58s because sure. that's like the industry, industry standard, standard. Yep. and they have the most feedback rejection and yep. they're the easiest to work with okay so we have that and now i'm doing my own monitors for the first time let's run from bar gig all the way up to pro tour okay uh so I, yeah, I agree with you. I think every singer, if you're a singer, especially if that's your your function in the band, you, I don't want to say just sing, but you just sing. Yeah, you should own your own microphone. That's your instrument, right? Mm -hmm. So, and especially you just want to spit into your own oh. spit, right? So like, <laughs> like you don't want to be sharing mics, yeah. especially after what we've just gone through as as a society. Yeah, right? like, yeah. I, I actually think that that's been a big eye opener for a lot of oh. us at jams and open yep. mics, where it's like. Maybe I want to pack my own mic. My, right? my company, like before COVID even happened, like I used to wipe down every mic after every band that played any festival on any stage, even jam nights I used to host. I just wipe them down and people thought it was just, I was a clean freak. And then all of a sudden COVID happened. Now everyone's like thanking me because I still do it. <laughs> right. I'm just like, I just never wanted to sing into somebody else's like, cause I, when I'm on a vocal mic, you know, that, that two finger rules, I'm usually right on it. Like I can feel the grill on mm -hmm. my lips. Same, right. So yeah. Um, so yeah, why do I want to share that with somebody else? So anyways, I digress. Um, no, actually, I, 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 before I, we go into monitoring, since you did the two finger rule, yeah. Yeah. let's talk about that and cupping mics. <laughs> uh, scary, scary, scary. Yeah, scary. Yeah. The, the cupping of the mic thing. It, 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 I guess, I think it came from the rap culture. I, I don't know. Maybe the metal culture yeah, too. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, the death metal guys seem to really rrr, rock it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's where the sound's going in. So to put your hand over top of that you know module on a mic is kind of silly you're just blocking everything right yeah. like if i block this microphone off you're not going to hear me well yeah same thing happens when it goes through you know a lot of people have this perception that it's changing the tone of their instrument which is their vocal and yeah it is but not for the better you're right. Right, right so you should practice yeah. singing into a mic if you want to you know hold the microphone closer and that's one thing, like get just behind the ball end of it. But I mean, ultimately to put your hand over top of it is very simple. Well, if you actually look at the engineering on a mic capsule, um, the backside is where that feedback rejection is. And the mm -hmm. Dooladyne principle that was uh, uh, Sure had engineered, it's the way the air flows from the front of the capsule to the back of the capsule. And um, that uh, phase when it hits the back of the capsule is what's creating that rejection. So what often happens when you cup that mic and you choke it up like that, you get feedback because yeah, you've now eliminated the airflow around the capsule. So it's all messed up. And then the new, the KSM-8 that I got just has it. Don't do it. Yeah, just don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. And if you hear feedback, putting it on yeah. the oh, cap makes it worse. That. Makes it worse. Yeah. It's like, oh, uh, it's yeah, yeah. like, no. Yeah. So you're mixing yeah. sound. I'm going to go for a moment and we'll come back to okay, it. Okay, sure, yeah. When you're mixing sound for an event and somebody somebody's like oh i'm going to be the mc for this event mm. and they've never handled a microphone oh, before the fun. is it it's i call it, it the italian hands they're talking like this they're holding the mic out here <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah. hey and i'm like no 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 you have to talk into it yeah i mean the, that's a, the proximity thing with almost any mic is that you have to be within that two finger rule like to hear anything quality you can start pulling away the the, the quality of your voice is going to get thinner and thinner and there's nothing a sound guy can really do about that right so if you're holding the mic down here by your leg and talking it's going to get a residual of your voice depending on how you know powerful of a speaker you are but it's not going to be great and yeah. for the sound guy to just turn that mic up which would be the logical thing to do it's just going to get, you're going to hear all this air in the PA. You're going to hear all this hissing sound and, you know, Lord help you if all of a sudden the mic comes back up and now you, your, your gain structure is gone completely whack. Your volumes are way too hot and that's where the squealy, squealy sounds start to come, right? So 
Yeah, I, I often, I teach a lot of people, you know, I can almost tell by their body language if they're comfortable on a mic or not. And yeah. uh, a lot Oh, of people, and they hold it, but they're like yeah. a little scared of it? A little scared of it. And, and, and again, the psychology behind it is sometimes if they're just an MC, I won't put their vocal in the monitor mm, because yeah. I find when people hear their voice for the first time, they become scared of it and they start holding the mic further away from their mouth. So I just kind of eliminate, they hear residual of the PA, which is in front of them. So it's, they're kind of behind it and they're like, okay, that that's okay. And then I can still control the volume and hopefully that's they got it smart. close. Right. Mm-hmm. So great point for all sound guys out there. If there's any sound guys listening or sound technicians listening, um, don't put, spoken word in the monitor I, you don't tend, need to that's i, I do the, i do the exact same thing yeah uh, where i, I go super smart uh, I, I, like there's some yeah. uh graduations i do right and uh for schools and you know principals talking and stuff and and as much as they're comfortable talking to a crowd they're not comfortable hearing their voice that loud mm-hmm. right so it's you have to sort of go okay this is a case where monitoring wouldn't be really necessary right so but often what happens is there's some sort of performer in the night that needs a monitor of course so you have to set one up and then your instinct is to put everything in the monitor of course and then you're like oops that was the wrong was instinct wrong. Yeah. right uh, i'm going to do another little psa for any person who's in an audience at an event watching somebody do public speaking and if you if you turn to the sound guy and go i can't hear them if the person if the sound tech is worth their salt they're 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 trying. Yeah, yeah. Right? They're sure. trying. So it, just take a look. And if you watch the way the person's handling the microphone, yeah. you know where the problem lies. It's not with the yep. sound tech not putting enough volume on the mic. I've, I've had, yeah. I'll have it actually this weekend too. I've had mayors of towns, you know, festivals I've been come up to do the announcements and or whatever. And they're talking so far away from a mic. And, and you know, the uh, organizers will be like, I can't hear them. Well, <laughs> Can you go tell them to talk into the instrument? Like that, that's that's I. There's no only so much I can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, think of it like a megaphone. If you were talking into a megaphone, you would put your mouth pretty much up to it. it's the same concept, mm-hmm. right? Right. So, but people, when their voice is amplified that loud through a big PA system, even if it's a small PA system, it's it's shocking when you haven't done. Hence, why you have to practice with it. Any band I was in ever, in especially in my 20s, we practiced setting up the PA, working the PA, rehearsing with the PA, tearing down the PA, seeing how fast we could do all of that. Yep. Especially if you're playing on a multi-band bill and you, you have to do these things. It's like, yeah. yeah, get good at your craft, right? Well, and when you start playing bar gigs and you're finishing at 12 or 1 in the morning and it takes you three hours to pack up, I mean, the sun's rising when yes. you're getting home. So you want to get that pack up to 30 minutes in the car, on yep. the road, and you're stopping out of Tim's or a Wendy's and you're and you're heading home. Spicy yeah. chicken sandwich. Yeah. Spicy chicken yeah. sandwich. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so we've gone over... Uh, front of house, well, that's a term we haven't used yet, but the speakers that face the audience, mm-hmm. front of house uh, speakers, uh, mixing, uh, back gain line. stage, back line, could, could finding hit, your tone, microphone could, usage. We haven't really done monitoring, but... Yeah, we, we started talking monitoring. Yeah. Could we hit EQing a little bit? Because like work. when you're sitting on a channel strip and you've got your gain stage and you've, you've got your, your, your main volume level, that's great. But there's a lot of people that like look at that. They're like either they, you know, dial them to twelve o'clock, like middle, and then like okay, walk away. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a lot of good that happens if you know a little bit about EQ. Well, I, you should start with exactly what you just said. Start at twelve o'clock. Okay, so step one: start at twelve o'clock. Yeah, like which mo- points up. Most basic mixers, like even if you bought like a box mixer, it'll have your your gain knob, and then it'll have. Like your car stereo, treble, mid, bass, right? It'll have right. something of that sort, right? And just like in your car, you kind of adjust those to what you think you like. Um, and, and this is where you, get, you start knowing your instrument. If you're a vocalist and let's say, you, let's say you're a female vocalist with a nice higher register and not so much bass in it, maybe you want a little bit more bass. That's where you would use that bass knob to maybe add a little bit of low end to your voice. Maybe you don't like that. Again, this is, you know... Now it's we're an into opinion. personal personal it's a, preference. It's personal therapy. preference and yeah. it's opinion. But there's also certain frequencies that develop when you start turning those knobs. So starting at 12 o'clock is a good starting point. But depending on how your monitors are set up or how your front of house is set up, you know, might hear some weird frequencies. And sometimes, you know, changing those treble mid or bass will offset some of those frequencies. We'll get into like the bigger boards that can actually zero down to every hertz that you hear. Yeah. Um yeah, you can you can mess with those a bit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I think it goes back to practicing with it, sure. right? Because if you have a Shure SM58 versus a Beta 58 mm-hmm. versus a KSM8, like a yep. Unidyne versus Dualidyne, you're they all sound different, 
and your voices all sound different. And that's why our band, we have four different microphones on stage, right? Because they all sound different and we've all picked a mic that we like the sound of. Sure. So My, mine's just an SM58 because I beat it up and I goober all over it. <laughs> one day I'm gonna go pick a uh, like a like a the Joe mic. Yeah, I'm a little I'm a little do, but yeah, it's it, good for you, man. It, it, I've got a chipped tooth from my SM58. Yep. We've yeah. got a good hair. Yeah. We got a good oh, history. Yeah, I like yeah. it. So starting at 12 o'clock with that EQ, and then if you like the sound, great. And if not, then you just cut or boost a little bit at a time till you like the sound. Yep. I think that's the way really with eq like i don't know if you're looking for more in-depth no I, I think i'm just these are things that come up with people when they get a their first box mixer and they're yeah they hit the gig and i they, think the, the some people might think that off and then more treble right like all the way off you start there but that's not because it's a cut or boost meaning that the centering frequency is flat response yep and then when at 12 o'clock and then if you you go up it's a boost and if you go down it's a cut usually of that set frequency and you might see a board in a box mis mixer with a parametric EQ mm -hmm. where you can select a frequency. I might call it a mid-morph or a mid-sweep. And, and those start at 12 o'clock. And <laughs> yeah. you can really make it sound bad with those, but you can also make it sound really good. So, so just play with it in, in your space, I think. Yeah, yeah. You have to, you have to experiment somewhere with mm -hmm. it. And you have to be, again, going back to that psychology part, if you're comfortable with it there, chances are if something does go wrong at the gig, you'll be comfortable fixing it, Yeah. right? So nothing worse than, I mean, we, we've probably all be, been guilty of this, but I'm gonna buy a new piece of gear and I'm gonna try it out at the gig, right? Yep. So like, you know, and, and you know, and I know we've all done it and we probably will all continue to do, but the reality <laughs> is you should go home, play that instrument or try that thing out and run it through its paces, see how it stands up to the rigors of, a, you know, a show. And then take it to a show. Yeah. You know, I've done it many times. I bought a new pedal. I'm like, oh, that's great. And I really didn't practice it. And then I'm stomping on it at a gig going, okay, well, it's not doing what I thought it was going to do. Right? Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. We've all been there. And that, and there's a high stress associated with that when yeah. the whole band's waiting for you to start a song, the audience is maybe already on the dance floor and now they're waiting for you to start the next song. And for whatever reason, you got no sound out of your rig. Exactly. It's way easier to spend a few hours and chilling in the garage and just yeah. goof around with it. Like I, why we don't always do that with all our gear. Somebody is funny. Somebody asked me the other day, I was doing sound for them, um, at a local show and they, they said, Oh, I, I just don't know anything about this. And I just, I wish I did. And how did you go about learning this? And I mean, there's basically probably three paths I can think of. One, you go to school for it. Mm -hmm. Two, you go and apply to work for a company that does it and you follow them around until you learn it. Yep. And three, you buy the gear and you sit in the garage and you figure it out. Yeah. You read the manual and you yeah. watch YouTube tutorials yeah. and, and you, just you do it. Goof and, around with and it. pick the brains of all the the people who've been doing it. Like I, while yeah. you're, I think it's a great thing. Well, this then you age. can amalgamate any of the three. Yeah, hundred yes. yeah. percent. Yeah. yeah. But in this day and age, I mean, just with the the internet age, like there's forums dedicated to that one thing you bought, right? Yeah, there's the people, mid morph knob, right? Like there's little people like <laughs> midmorphknob.com. <laughs> yes, it's uh, name my next band. Uh, the midmorphs. <laughs> yeah, we should do a podcast just on band names. Band yeah. names for sure. But yeah, like there's there's so much information out there where people can help and and you know yeah you can look it up and it's, people it's, are willing like if they're, they're, you just they're, ask the questions yeah. like everyone's pretty chill there's also just a laziness factor right yeah. where people buy gear and they're just out of the box thinking okay well i'll just turn it on and it'll work and and yes it will but you still need to manipulate it on some level and know what you're doing mm -hmm. right so yeah. I, I wish it was that easy right to just hey just set up a stage in this gigantic pa and just hey plug into there i think it's yeah. gonna work like yeah you know there's hours of routing and homework i do just to make sure that a show is flawless mm -hmm. and it's still never going to be flawless no, but you're but just prepared when you do that then you know how to, on the fly how to fix it quick right 100%. and that's where the real art becomes as a pro guy when you're doing it for a living mm -hmm. is how quickly can i fix the problem not that there's not going to be any problems it's just how quickly can i yep. fix that and who's going to notice like if i can fix it before it's a um a noticeable problem great and then you would just be flying around no yep. problem Exactly. Yeah. Think about all the times where like all the different, uh, you talk about all the different links in the chain, any one of mm. them can fail. So like your signal path, your power, uh, and, and they're all, these little cables are, mm -hmm. are the magic along the way. So getting yeah. to a gig and we're running wires and cables and hooking everything up oh. and 
And T minus, we're supposed to be starting in 15 minutes, and yeah. we're not getting anything. The bride's anything. walking down the aisle. Yeah. Uh, oh. There's no sound. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in gigs like that, there's zero room for error, right? Yeah. Like it's oh. especially if it's a wedding gig. The, the, you know, zero. There's, there's zero room. Camera so you, crews are filming. Yeah, you you, you have to be on it. Right? You <laughs> have to know your stuff, right? Yeah, and, uh, yeah. That is not the place to figure it out. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah you want well, to be pretty interesting. Lickety split there. Even just setting up this podcast we we had that moment where we we went okay the mic is plugged into the board the board is plugged into the streaming console and the console's plugged into the tablet and we went okay we're not hearing anything okay well i went oh channel strip one metering's working great okay then i follow the channel strip over master yes i'm getting metering on the master it's saying that's sending signal okay great so then i'm outputting from my my mono sum out to the streaming device. Okay, great. I shoot over there. Okay, look, we got signal light coming in here. That green light, use it green yeah, as go, yeah. right? And we just follow the green light. Okay, now we know we're all the way to there and it's working. Why is it not coming through the headphones? Yep. So then we got to figure out at that point what part is where the next the, part in the, where chain. In the chain. Yeah. And most people point to the first thing in the chain. So they, well, your mic's not working. Yo. Oh. It's like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> oh, it's broken. Your guitar's yeah, not It's broken. Working. Yeah. But if you go through the whole chain, <laughs> as soon as you go, I'm not getting a green light, we got a problem. And, and yeah. so that's that's why they install these green lights on all the different channel strips and all the different yeah. points where you can go, oh, I'm getting signal here. Mm -hmm. So let's jump back to monitoring because yes. there's a bunch of different routes you can go with this. And mm -hmm. we have you. agreed on... Getting ready to get back to monitoring. We think similarly, I think, on our personal experience on monitoring that we've gone to uh, in-ear... Oh yeah, wireless monitoring. Yep. You can do in ear wired monitoring yep. uh, versus stage monitoring. So let's you do both. Let, yeah, <laughs> or, yeah, I was I was talking with a band who was talking about how uh, the idea of switching from the wedges they know and love to going to in ears seemed like a technological jump that they weren't ready to make. And I've heard that a few times with people like that. Just seems like way more technology than I can handle. But that that's come a long way. Like we oh, think of well, in ear yeah. monitoring needing massive racks of well, of there's transmitters, there's receivers, still and probably some merit in the massive rack. And I'll discuss. Uh, I think it was Adam Nitty, a bass player. He, he I was following his tour rig. Uh, or Adam Neely. 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 Yeah. Thank you. And he's touring Europe and he's bringing his whole monitor rig. So we can talk about a really pro, pro audio yeah, touring bro. guy cool. because um, getting a great monitoring experience as the artist helps you perform better and so exactly. so if you know the audience is getting a great job because the sound technician is taking care of it well how do you get the great experience too so yeah if we rewind back to the bar we've set up the front of house we've figured out our back line we're balanced our gain stages are set everything's working and now where do we put these monitors how do they make us have a good experience as a performer and then why would i then maybe choose a different rig and then maybe how to go about constructing that rig. Maybe we'll tear it apart from there. Okay. You want to run with that, Leo? Sure, yeah. So we'll start with actual, like, a real monitor on the yeah. floor in front, of, in front of the artist. So there's, I mean, ultimately, that's the the artist's reference point, right? That's what they're hearing back. So every artist is different. So I'll use myself as, as an example. I'm a guitar player who sings. Most of what I want to hear in that monitor is me, <laughs> right? I want to hear my vocals and maybe a bit of my guitar. Depending on where my guitar is on stage, maybe it's too far away and instead doing what every guitar player does, which is go and turn it up, <laughs> which now is flooding the stage with more volume, I leave it where it is and go, okay, I'm gonna use the board to give me more of that signal in my monitor that, that is right in front of me, right? Um, I know I'm a crazy guitar player for that. No, but hey, this hey, is where you talk. With it. I know You're not. that's unorthodox. <laughs> but it goes to eleven. It right? goes to eleven. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, so, but it, back in the day, that's what would happen. PA technology was not at a point where it was able to push all the instruments on stage out there. So most PA's were just kind of like vocal PA's for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why you saw these walls of amps. Like you think of the '70s and '80s, and just walls and walls of amps because they were actually pushing volume from the stage, and that's what the audience was hearing. Nowadays all that is negated right like i remember seeing uh bb king at the molson amphitheater i guess the budweiser stage now years yeah. ago and he had this little fender like 20 i think i was at that amp. show <laughs> yeah and it was like tiny and they had a little single mic in front of yeah. it but it's going through this ginormous pa system that fills the amphitheater and it sounded huge 
Again, yep. you can mic up anything and make it sound huge if you have the power behind mm -hmm. it. The, so the advent of the lunchbox amp. Exactly. Once again, right? that that backline's about tone. Exactly. If you if you keep that in your mind, it's about getting tone. my tone, and then we can mic it or line it out. Exactly. And on that note, we've switched to not having any backline. We're running all preamps. Yep. Um, so like a, direct, a little right? pedal that has a direct out to mm -hmm. it uh, that we can run in front of house. And then all I hear is what's coming back through the monitor. So for you, you like more of you. Yeah, and, my monitor. And a lot of um, apps for like the higher end consoles that have apps, they have the more me you yeah. can just bring <laughs> yeah. that up. And um, for us, like for 75% of our band likes to hear the front of house mix in our monitor, which is oh, yeah. actually very rare. Most people yeah. don't like that, but we like to hear it very, the whole experience, which might be part of my fault for training them to like that because I'm the guy running out front trying to hear the front of house mix while mixing sound. Sure. So I fed the front of house mix to the wedge and just brought it to a lower level. Well, and I think but. we grew up in a setting where, like grew up musically, where we were worried about the product. We, yeah. were, we were aware that we were worried about the product we were putting out as opposed to just worried about me. Right. And right. I think there's also, from our age group, because I was the same way raised musically in an environment where we just didn't have monitors. We, That's true too. Like we had a PA, so the crowd could hear us, but there was no monitors. So we got used to Hearing kind of it. listening out and going, okay, I think it's good enough. Yeah. And if we had a monitor of some sort, we just wanted whatever the audience was hearing. We were like, okay, yeah. then, then we feel comfortable. Again, that psychology of, yeah. I'm hearing the same thing they are. It sounds good. Let's go. Right. Right. But nowadays you can have monitors. Like when I run a, sh a big show, it's upwards of 10 mixes on stage. So 10 mm -hmm. different mixes can happen. If there's 10 people on stage, let's say you have Slipknot on stage, they're all hearing different things. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah. Uh, but most bands, like with your band, if you're a four or five piece, right, I can give you four or five different mixes. So yeah. Joe is going to hear something different from Dave if he wants to. And usually that is what is exactly is yeah. happening. Well, and it's interesting because uh, the last 25% of our band does want to hear a different mix. That's a more me mix. I'm not pointing out names just yeah, yeah, yeah. for fun. But um, that more me mix uh, is we have it on the console. So yep. we run that, that second monitor mix for that one person and they get exactly what they're looking for. Um, and they're, they perform better hearing it that way. Yeah. And I perform better hearing the blend of our vocals balanced as it would be per to the audience. So, gotcha. so it's a personal preference, but, uh, it's an interesting thing. So, so we got those wedges. So, so we got the wedges. They're pointing up at us. We probably only have two, right? Let's say we have two. We're okay. at a bar because most box mixers run two mains, two monitors, just the yep. way they're designed. So say we're running one of those systems. We have two wedges and we have a four piece band. We have a drummer, lead vocalist who plays rhythm guitar. Cool. An electric guitar, lead guitar, and a bass. So Perfect. there's our four piece. So in, in that case, what I, I find, again, the psychology of most of those bands is that they're all playing whatever songs they're playing. Um, they are all going off whatever the vocalist is doing. There's, that's their cues for the song, right? Uh, you always find it interesting in a live scenario, when you go look at a really super pro band that's playing a song, and if the vocalist goes off script or isn't there, the band still plays the song exactly in the parts how it was designed where a lot of bands can't do that they practice the song and if the vocalist doesn't come in on the one with their part the band goes oh what's going on right so because of that i find everyone wants to hear vocals especially the lead vocal um so that's usually the first thing that goes in monitors for me is let's put the vocals in there so if there's one or two or three or four vocals let's put them all in there so everyone can hear the vocals and then your instrument just becomes almost like a pad underneath to that, right? That doesn't need to go in the monitor, but if you have enough channels, I guess you could do that. But yeah, it starts with the vocals yeah. and anything that needs a direct signal. So like an acoustic guitar is not going to be heard over PA unless it's plugged in. So maybe you need that reference point back through or a piano, right? You could get away with yeah. the rest of the band not being in those monitors. Right. right. Yeah. And for a lot of bands, especially ones that run backline, um, cause we, we would need something in there cause of not having a backline, but sure, you're right. yeah. if you have a bass amp and a guitar amp and a keyboard amp, then 
that is your monitor. Yep. So you're getting it in your monitor mix and you're getting a more me monitor mix by by doing that. Yeah. And and that's where the 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 magic knob of like, oh, but I need more me. Yes. But it but it floods yeah. the stage. It and floods and, and that's classic. the sound guy's nightmare, sound technician's nightmare is the 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 more me and the and the amp. Yeah. Right. And it for me it's it's always the lead guitar player has the <laughs> you do sound check, everything's mm-hmm. perfect. You're like three songs in and they get a solo and they go and turn the amp up to 11 and they never turn it back down yeah and then they wash out the whole stage and you're dumping your monitor mix you're dumping the mains you're trying to and that's, then the whole show sounds oh, bad 100%. for the audience that's right? why like you, you have to always consider your environment of where you're playing too so guitar players are inherently the worst for this and i, I can say that honestly as a guitar player you know, when I was younger, I bought a 412 and a 100 watt head. And I was like, yeah, that's the, you know, sometimes two 412s. Because you see yep. your heroes doing that. And you're like, yeah. I need that. If you're playing any bar and you're showing up with a 412 cab and a 100 watt head, I mean, you should be shot. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, you know, there, there's no, settle down, right? Like, you don't need that. It's absolutely yeah. silly, right? It, even 50 watt heads are they're too much. And, yeah. and I, I always tell guitar players, my own students even, that it's like driving a Ferrari. You don't know what a Ferrari does until you get up over 200 kilometers per hour. And a 100 watt head or a 50 watt head, same thing. The tone in it isn't really generated until you turn up to a certain volume. And that certain volume is ear splitting loud. It's designed for outdoor use. It's designed for arenas. It's designed for that. To do that at, you know, the little pub in your little town, yeah. like... You're not going to get a good tone of it unless you turn it up to that spot. Right. So don't do that. Buy yeah. buy an amp that you know is conducive to the place you're playing. Like I actually have three different sets of amps, right? Like I have a little literally ten watt amp that I have gigged with because when I dime it, it's a perfect stage volume. Yeah. Right. And I mic it up anyways. It's going through the PA, yep. so it's perfect stage oh, volume. Better, yeah. Gives me one. I have a twenty five sort of watt amp, and then I have a fifty to hundred watt that I use only on outdoor stages, and I rarely get to use that. Right. Like unless it's festival season, then yeah, then it's there, and I love to turn yeah. it up because you're outdoors and you, the sound can project differently. Yeah, you're in a little, you know, Joe's pub. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm, a, I'm gonna I was, after pointing <laughs> my finger at the guitar the players. <laughs> After pointing my finger at the guitar players, I'll point it back at myself for sure. a sec for entertainment purposes. Now, solid state is different than tube. hundred percent. So volume gain stage on tubes is critical to get the tone. Yes. Solid state, you can often get most of your tone at a low level. Yep. So so if you're a guitar player or a bass player and you're you're tossing a coin between the two, think about that. If you if you need it to go really quiet, maybe solid state's a better option for you because you can get that tone quietly. Um I played the gray goat mm. Mm. <laughs> with a trainer 410. Oh my God. <laughs> the DB800 oh. in a 6U rack with a compressor, rack compressor, light pipe, power conditioner, rack tuner. Yeah. Wait, wait Lord, I, was I at this gig? Yeah, it yeah. was Ainsworth. I know, I was going to say. <laughs> so I was using, I would have been using an 18 inch bass, like a tiny little club kit. Of course, perfect. 18 inch bass drum. Sensible. Yeah. yeah. Not so sensible. No. <laughs> now, I did run it responsibly, so much so that Dave Shumka did tell me to turn up. Oh, good. So when the keyboard player is telling the bass player to turn up, that's rare. Yeah. Especially because they like the low end of the keys. Stay yeah. out of my area. But, um, <laughs> yes. He told me to turn up, so I did run it responsibly, but that was the only rig I owned. And that's yeah. where you get back to your point where three rigs might be what you need. And now I have a pre that I can run independent, and then I have a base stack that's scalable. For- yeah, and, and again, I, I mean, I'm I'm a weird guy with my gear because, I, I mean, I do this for a living. So, yes, I have three rigs. I probably have more than three rigs at this point, but... I'm also a gear head, so like I love buying yeah. this stuff and I love experimenting with it and trying things out. Not everyone's going to have that option, and, and no one, you know, maybe gigs as much as we do. Right. But either way, like buy something that's sensible. Like anything, the second you get into 50 watts or above, is yeah. it, it is really just silly if you're not playing environments that are conducive yeah. to needing that sort of volume. Yeah. Right? If you're going to buy one amp, a guitar, let's say guitar, maybe. Something with a power sponge, they call it. Yeah. Or a power or soak, or, soak. Or, or yeah. yeah. And you can or shut her down. Some do of the even the new wattage. digital or, or solid state heads have like different power consumptions in it. Like they can run at 0.5 of a watt, or yeah. you know, like and so like yeah. those are neat, or you know, but yeah, you just it, it's not required anymore. No. PA technology has come along so far that even your most bare bones PA 
it's going to push the volume harder than your amp ever could do, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you've got and enough channels to do that. You get yeah. it often up front, and we didn't mention, but up high, you usually want it up at head height. So, yes. don't put those main speakers on the floor. On the floor, we forget yes. about that. We you didn't want mention the it. sound to travel. It will yeah. eventually just dip off, but yeah, get up a you know kind of. Just Head height a little above your head. I'm short, yeah. so above little, me. Yeah. Um, you know, and and, and yeah. you'll find it'll travel, and you know that's kind of what you're supposed to. Yeah. Some people get scared of it because it's more stuff to bring, right? So right. if you have a little eight channel mixer and you're putting like you know your four vocals in and you only have four inputs left, you know you maybe mic up your guitar, mic up the keyboard, maybe mic up the kick drum, just to add a little bit of balance. The keyboard definitely needs it to be in the mains. Your guitar, if you, I find, like I always mic up my guitar in almost every bar mm -hmm. gig I do because I can keep my stage volume down and give myself more monitor of that guitar. Yeah. That's pointing back at me and not pointing out there. So I'm happy. Yeah. But I also practice hearing what that sounds like because it is a vastly different tone mm -hmm. than what's happening out of my amp. But we're old yeah. school, so yeah. we're just happy to it's hear true. something. And so, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You're the talking days about of playing like, uh, feels like the right note I'm singing. Yeah. <laughs> that feels like the right note I'm playing. You're talking about the uh, the oh, just two speakers and on your way. And uh, and I was waiting for anybody to mention like oh, just dip a little sidewash. Yes. Oh, turn, yes. Turn, 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 turn for a little. Yeah. I've and done actually, it. that's a very good point to touch upon because we're talking about stage volume and keeping it down. Mm. If you're gonna gig even once a week, but I mean, if you're two oh, or three times yeah. a week, I mean, you're going to hurt your hearing. Yes. And it's the tool we need for the, our whole life as a, as a career. If you yep. lose that, you, your career's over. Pick a new, pick so a new. So for fashion. guys like yep. us who are doing it regularly, protecting that is key. And why you went in yours. Exactly. Thank you for that. Yep. You segued right into it. Mm -hmm. So the other option um, when you're buying a monitor rig is to go to in-ears. So it's wearing like an earbud and you'll have usually a wireless body pack, but they have wired ones have wired that ones are more too. affordable. And it's just like a little I have my pack and an XLR. I had chuckling. I was like, it's right around the corner. But it's, <laughs> I have mine. It's like we have to, like it's just like a really nice set of the same set of earbuds you'd use for listening to music at home. Yeah. Yep. A lot yep. more comfortable. They're going to be sitting there for a while. So you got to get you practice that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and for us, we find that we keep one in and one out. So that way we can still kind of get. The room, sound. the room, and what's yeah. going on. I've seen some guys throw a mic at the audience, yeah, to get a little, like, yeah, because they're like, that. I want to know what's yeah. going on out there. Someone's yeah, like, point a mic out. The, the guy on the banjo really sucks, and I was like, <laughs> I want to know what you're saying. Yeah, well, in the higher quality the in ear monitor, the more likely it has really good sound um, isolation, mm -hmm. um, and upwards of you know twenty to thirty dB of of decibels of of cut to that sound isolation, which makes you feel like you're you've yeah, in a you cabin. Know, yeah, 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 yeah. And so that's one experience. But also it means um, stage volume's down, you're protecting your hearing, and you can, as long as you don't turn your body pack up too loud, and then you can... Uh, you can control that and you can gig three, four times a week without damaging your hearing, yep. which is important. I got blown away at one of our more recent gigs where I was switching instruments and, and uh, in the process, my, my earbud pulled out and, I, and we were still playing and I was switching on the fly and I just was like, this is like dead silent up here. Like it oh, is yeah. like compared to what for years we gigged with. Yeah. And I was just, blo I just took a little moment to, not too much of a moment. Yeah. We were mid song, yeah. but an enough moment just like, oh yeah. And then it was like, ah, keep, yeah. Yeah. keep going. Yeah. But, yeah. but well, it was that like, great goat gig with the 800 watt bass stack. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So <laughs> love because my bass stack was so big, I had to stand in front of the PA speaker Yeah. as a yeah. bass player. And, oh. and I put, I had ear plugs, mm -hmm. which is different than an in-ear monitor for our listeners. It's um, like just a decibel cut. It's just the isolation portion of it to deaden the sound. And I had put the one in, and and by the end of the night, that ear was still just ringing. It was just no, it was here, and it was yeah. just blasting me. Um, so, anyways, let's go back to in-ear monitors. So. Yeah. You're thinking, oh, maybe we want to go in ear monitors. It's less gear to carry. It's lighter weight. It's yep. easier to mix. It gives you the isolation. It allows you to control stage volume, protect your hearing. Um, and the idea of one in and one out to get used to it and whether you want two in and how isolated you want to feel, whether you set up a room mic or talk back mic to the band. Some people mm -hmm. will do that and just have it in the monitor only. Yep. So you can do all those kind of fancy things. This is now scalable. Uh, to pro touring. Um, so uh, some tours you just show up and you tell them, so 
I guess we should touch on that. Being able to communicate to the sound technician what you want in your monitor. So we kind of touched on that. Yep. I want me or everyone or whatever. So then if you're doing in-ears, you're probably bringing them. It's not likely the tour is supplying them per se. They might supply the body packs and the transmitter, but you're bringing your own earbuds. So yeah, you want to just for hygiene purposes. Hygiene, yeah. yeah. So you want to research. Bring your own mic. <laughs> bring your own earbuds. Continue. Yeah. So research anything close to the body. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you feel about bring your own mic? Like, because like some people bring out like Garbo mics. Oh, it, it, here's the here's the thing for me. Yeah. I'm all I, for, I'm all for you bring your own mic, but. Also take pride in your work. Like if you're going to show up with a $30 mic that you found on the side of the road because that's your mic. I got how, how you use that Radio Shack. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, most production companies take pride in their gear, so they'll have a quality something. And let's not diminish the quality of your show by bringing something that's inferior. Right? Yeah. So would it work? For sure it would work. But let's, you know. If have you ever, have you ever had some? In. Have you <laughs> have ever had somebody show up with something and you're like, I, I, I'm gonna sub that out? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. many times. Uh, I've I've had people, I've had drummers t- take off, you know, my three thousand dollars worth of cymbals that I provide that I'm allowing them to play and replace it with Sabian B eights or, or, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they're like, well, I like the tone of this, and I'll, and my thing is, well, then you don't know what tone is, right? Like, <laughs> you know what? I, okay, right, so, so as a as a as a drum nerd there are times where i've got some weird inexpensive but pieces of gear that i won't part with yeah. so i will i will say every so often yeah there's some funky but anyways because it's like anyway, continue, it, it, continue. it's a personal thing right yeah, so when preference. it comes to stuff like that if you want to play through great I, I i had a i had a bass player last season show up and he didn't want to play through the 610 ampeg that i had with a, you know an 800 watt mess ahead he didn't want to play through that he brought his little fender rumble and I was like, really? And he goes, oh, I, I made a bunch of presets. So I was like, okay, fair yeah. enough. You know, yeah. I, I get yeah, it. You know. I get it. He goes, you know, I love to use that amp, but this is what I need for this show. Mm-hmm. Do what you got to do. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that it does t- That takes a little confidence to say that, too. You're like, oh, I'm going to use, the, yeah. As you a, know, as yeah. opposed to this thing, but right? But that goes back to sitting in the garage and researching your tone and so finding res- your settings. I respected and, the process. They did yeah. their work. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. then I'm going to mic that up. It's about doing the work, and, yeah. Right? So you have to kind of do that you know that homework yeah. at home you got to practice your gear yeah right so yeah it happens people yeah. show up sometimes with some inferior stuff but if yeah. there's a reasoning behind it again it, it'll work but at for me as a sound tech I, I always have a backup especially when it comes to vocal mics if it's an inferior vocal mic if it's made of a plastic sort of you know has thing, a built-in cable yeah you know like, or something that's, <laughs> yeah, a quarter inch. it went from a quarter inch to the night i'm just like yeah let's I, I'm gonna have one here on deck ready for when yeah. that fails because right. inadvertently it's gonna fail during their show. Yeah. yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for us, when we built the in ear rig, mm-hmm. we wanted it simple. We wanted it affordable. Um, so we went with a company called X Vive, and they make yep. just the dongle. It has a lithium battery in it that's rechargeable. I bought one. Yeah. yeah. yeah you plug good. it right into the board and it sends to our body packs. And we can pair as many body packs on the same channel as we want. So so one mix across the whole band. Yeah. And so right. we're running two rigs. So we have one mix for 75% and one mix for 25% of the band. But you just do a different dongle and a separate channel. And for when we're talking about dongles, for people just kind of visualizing, at the end of every single one of these mics is the end of the XLR cable. It plugs in just like these do. Yep. It's just like a hair bigger, a hair bulkier, but it's almost like the XLR cable minus the cable. That's yeah, kind of yeah. the yeah. size in, and kind of visual. Cable. It's the invisible cable. Mm-hmm. And then we all bought different in-ears um, based on what our budget was and what our specs we wanted. I went to, because being the bass player, I went to a really... a triple armature blah 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 silly i probably didn't need to but i did uh to get more bass and clarity in the low end but everyone else went with the i, I did sure 215s 215s like I'm they're the five solid 35s but, or whatever sure. um you know part of me for me is i always balance my road gear knowing my road gear is going to get beat to crap yeah. now so you, back to the sure yeah. sm58 guy I agreed i yeah, understand yeah. that now yeah. you, you went, the, so we're talking about just the earbud part with the cable and then the body pack and everything else is separate. Uh, some systems are sold with the earbuds, usually mm-hmm. the 215s or something. Yep. Now you went a totally different route with your with the buds. You went... Um, I went and customized mine. Yeah. yeah, I went and saw an ear doctor Yeah. Um, and her, her practice uh, paired with a company in the States that builds medical grade, it, like in-ear units for elderly people right nice. so just hearing aids but they made a musician brand so i had 
yeah, different colors, <laughs> yeah. but they had all these different drivers in them. Uh, so she did a mold of my ear, which was very intrusive. Like she fills your ear with this <laughs> and you sit there for 15 minutes while it hardens oh. and she pulls it out and it's like, oh. it's, it's everything. I should probably do that mo- once a month and get these yeah, off there. It's, it's, it's something. Uh, yeah. but they made an in-ear monitor that's the exact mold of my ear, um, which is what the pros do yeah. when you, you know, that's what they're using so that you can jump around, you can move around and these things will not leave your ears. As I mentioned earlier, but when the earbud fell Pops out with it. an instrument yeah. change. And then your comfort level is probably... Well, it, it acts as two things. It, the, the, uh, the isolation is huge because like it really the suction cups you in like as though you're covering your ears and... So now you're in your own head, which again, if you're going to just stand on stage and try that, it's going to go bad. You oh need, yeah. You need to practice what that feels and sounds like so that you can still perform as a musician. So yeah, I mean, I, I got those made. Um, they were a little bit pricier for sure, but the, you know, the warranty was great. Every time I heard even a crackle, I'd send it back to this company and they'd put on a new harness and they had my oh, molds on file so they could make new molds. Like it was yeah, crazy. crazy. Um, yeah. But yeah, very, very cool. Experience. Once again, it, you're protecting your livelihood. Yeah, essentially, yeah. right? Right. And I and I use them as a like when I play drums. Like apparently, my ear canal could handle a little sub driver. So like to get the kick now in my monitor. No I, way. And I was like, ooh, yeah, that feels good, right? Like, oh you know? no. So way. like like yeah, she was able to say, yeah, your ear canal is big enough to handle this, this, and this, and we recommend these ones for you. And I was like, yeah, let's do it up. Mm-hmm. I often think when we talk this way about gear and you talk about like being a gearhead and somebody who appreciates good gear, um, if we were to talk, if this was a table of carpenters talking about, which, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. And we were talking about the tools to do the difference between, you know, slapping together two by fours and making a, a deck and making fine furniture. Or right? a guitar. Or yeah, a guitar, guitar luthier yeah. equipment. We'll talk about that more another day. But the idea that, you know, when we're, we're talking about the tools that are used in the trade, when your craft becomes more precise, your tools become more precise. Oh, yeah. And that's where you say, this is an investment, not just, you know what I mean? Yeah. So protecting your ears. Yeah. Like when you hear like what, what type of level of uh, yeah, steel toe boots to, you know, safety equipment that you would use if you were doing construction, the more you do it, the better the quality of the equipment you'd be using because yep. you don't want to have that get in the way. Well, same for us. Yes. And in your exactly. monitoring has been a game changer for yep. us, especially for stage volume, oh. clarity, um, yeah, easier. Well, and pack. I mean, yeah, we've for said all what that. we're bringing, it's the same weight as the Tim's order we bring. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Versus or the Alpita or wedge or, Alpita, or yeah. Alpita. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, and, or four wedges, right? For that matter, right? Like that would be so heavy, right? Yeah. Even if you got really small ones, there's still a twenty or thirty pounds if you get tiny ones. Yep. And there's sixty pounds if if not. So here here's the the opposite of it though, right? So I've been in many bands where everyone's on in ears, um, and what happens when it fails? Right, so uh-huh. in your in your goes down. And all of a sudden, you don't have that reference point because a lot of bands have never practiced. I mean, we're old school and have played many shows, mm. many many shows where you yeah. didn't have monitors. So if it happened, your batteries went dead, which is usually the case in your in ears, and you're like, okay, could you still play? You know, the psychology behind, do I know my craft well enough to get through the show, or yeah. is this a breaking point for me? Right. right. So again. Oh, now on the bigger shows, on the bigger production shows, they will have in ear mixes for all the artists, and they'll have wedges that some most times are a different mix. Hmm. So, like for I've done bigger shows, funny enough for myself, <laughs> where <laughs> in my in ears I just have my guitar and my vocal, and that's it. I find the more things I put in my in ears, it's too much because it's hitting my brain too fast, and and hmm. I I got so used to hearing it come from a monitor up. And there's that delay. There is mm-hmm. actually a multi-millisecond delay coming at you. So to hear it there is, is too much. So guitar and vocal only there. And in my wedge, I had the other vocalists. Because you get a bleed of it. It's not, like, yeah. it's not like you're in your own world forever, right? Right. You can still hear drums. Like, you know, a little bit of this and that there. But I put that in the wedge. And that's what you see on the bigger shows, right? Yeah. There's many, many monitor mixes happening. The monitor guy's job is essentially the most important job because... They need to make sure that artist is so comfortable with everything they're hearing that the show is good because that's how they're going to get paid. Right? Yeah, <laughs> so, right. um, and that that can be very daunting when you know you've never done an in ear or you've never done a monitor mix is knowing what you actually need to survive. Mm-hmm. Right? We're survivors. We can literally play with nothing. Right? Yeah. Like, we, you know, like, yeah. I, well, yeah, you know, so much so that we've got to gig so on such a tight timeline. 
late and <laughs> went, Joe, Mel, go in the crowd and start playing. And Joe grabs a guitar or banjo and Mel yeah, grabs yeah. a fiddle and we play fully acoustic and they just go off playing. Well, John and I or Connor start wiring, wiring like animals, yeah, right? Especially and if something like, went boom, wrong. Boom, boom, boom. You didn't yeah. leave yeah. enough time for something oh, to go wrong. Yeah. That at the Dalrymple wedding, that was 10 years ago, we were on a bad generator oh, and the yeah. whole PA it almost went up in flames. It was screaming and shut off. It was like, what happened? I don't even know. And it was like a surge from the surge from generator. The so the lights, all the lights in the pew. And the wow. mixer, the mixer went dead. We couldn't get it up and running. So Joe, John and Mel, no, Barb at the time, Barb, yeah. they went in the crowd playing acoustically and entertaining. I don't even know if they knew it wasn't intentional. And Connor and I started repatching all the powered speakers. So that was like, a microphone in this one, a microphone in this one. And then it was like, sing loudly into a couple random microphones. Yeah. And we played the whole rest of the night that way. Right. right. So, and probably nobody really noticed Andrew or Terry. No, no, no they, uh, they no, had a no, great time. They had a wonderful time. And we just got uh, a, an email request to see if we'll do their anniversary. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> I love yeah, it. That's perfect. And we'll bring our own generator. <laughs> <laughs> but those experiences, yeah. a lot of bands never understand, right? They, so they, they need, that's why they need to practice their gear. Like, and, and I see it so often bands mm -hmm. showing up and, and they, they, it, it reminds me of my first studio experience where I just thought vocally the producer was going to make me sound good. I didn't come in prepared, mm. right? I just thought he would push some buttons and turn the suck button down, you know, <laughs> and, and all of a sudden I would be better. Yeah. And or I realized, I'll just fix it in post. Yeah, I'll just fix hey. it in post, right? <laughs> um, but the reality is you have to work on your craft just like you have to work on setting up a PA. You have to work on your amps. You have to work on how tight is that skin on your kick. Like, is that the tone I want? Like, all these things. And also learning how to adapt when you are in a bigger show where backline is provided and there's a drum kit there and there's an amp there and it's not what you usually play for. Oh, and yeah. can you adapt to it and still put on the show that you want to play, mm -hmm. right? Well, drummers in the house kit. Like yeah. you, that's, that, that's an entire forum. Oh, drummers right. playing the house kit and yeah. Yeah. Oof. Yes. I, and I mean, if we tie this back to monitoring, in-ear monitoring mm. again, and Adam Neely. Neely. Yeah. So their experience touring was that they weren't getting a good monitor mix and it was negatively affecting their performance. Sure. So they decided they wanted a way to go out every night with the exact same monitor mix and get the exact same experience. And so output. They, but uh, yeah, they, they did both. It was really interesting. Continue though. Right. So... I don't know what you mean by output yet, but like, you, you, yeah, I'll, you I'll, I'll get bring there. me up to speed on what you mean by output. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, so what they did is they brought a whole mixing console. Yep. They ran a split snake, it's called. Yep. Um, or a split patch bay, I think. And yeah. they, they patched the whole thing, did a whole monitor mix with all their in-ear racks, all the multi-monitor mixes for everybody, all labeled. And then the front of house guys at the venue would just come in and patch into their, their patch panel and go vocal, bass, guitar, piano, drums, and take their mix and then run that to front of house. Yep. Right. Um, so we look at buying just a dongle and getting a monitor mix to buying a wireless transmitter. Oh, actually go under the dongle to the, the hardwired yep. head preamp you can get from a ART Pro Audio makes one. Um, so then you go to like a whole wireless unit that has multi channels on it to maybe four of those units. So everybody mm -hmm. has their own mix. And then what do you, and then you look at doing a whole pro audio mixing console just for monitors just for, for monitors. yourself. Yeah. So, I mean, and then they put it in a road case and they just put that on the plane and it goes to every gig. Yep. Now, what yeah. did you mean by? Oh, sorry. I, I, I might've mis uh, misunderstood or maybe I'm remembering incorrectly. I thought they had it where what they gave to the sound guy was like, their entire final product for the output like what mm. so they just ran like an xr yeah, that doesn't happen yeah no, like, so I mean, maybe you, i misunderstood you it you could do that the problem is a room is going to react totally different, different, yeah. different yeah, to yeah. all the frequencies I, i've had artists try to do that with me on yeah. some of my bigger shows because on my bigger production shows we always offer a split a split snake for the artists on stage because we get it all the time where artists will show up with their console that has um they're in your units and their own mixing, blah, blah, blah. And we have to give them a split off that, but it never affects front of house. So the whoever's running front of house is getting the same signal and mixing it how they want for that room or that outdoor festival. Yeah. Uh, and then the artist is happy with hearing what they've always heard. Right? Yeah. So I mean, the, the biggest nightmare would be you give them that mix and the subwoofer, the bass is, now that they're subs versus yeah. your in-ears, the bass is crazy loud and the kick's crazy loud. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, and, that, and, that's the, it, probably the biggest red flag oh for sure and you don't want to relinquish control of them controlling front of house because 
they, they, just, know they don't know, right? They don't right. know what's happening. And you're on standing on stage, so ultimately you don't know what it sounds like no. out right, there, right. right? But you do know what your monitor sounds you like. You know what your monitor sounds like. And that is everything. That's that psychology again. If you're mm-hmm. happy with what you're hearing and you've practiced it that way and that's normalized for you, yep. right. then you will perform better, yep. right? Like that's well, just the way it is. To build a rig like that, they would have spent a lot of time researching the, the components, operating the components, maintaining the components, yep. mixing the sound, like every practice or rehearsal is probably done with the in ears, and, and then you rehearse with yep. your gear, you rehearse yep. with your sound tech, yeah, so that it's done flawless. So you get to the gig and you're ready. You know what to expect. So on so. that on that note, there, I think at this point we've taken it from amplified. Know, yeah, we've amplified, <laughs> but we've taken it from you know your your left and right at the at the pub to. Yep. You're gonna to go touring, and you're able to equip yourself in a way. So I think we've amplified really well we're today. Amplified, <laughs> uh, Leo. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, today. thanks for having me, guys. Love fun. Absolute hoot. So uh, and then stay tuned because there'll be uh, our next uh, podcast in a month, and lots of good things talking there. So keep uh, keep an eye for that. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Cheers. <laughs>